Will Gotham ever escape the chains of its own corruption? Is Batman, powerful and symbolic as he is, truly the best solution to Gotham's deeply entrenched problems? Sure, he must continue to fight the supervillains, there's no story without those epic battles. But through the years, Batman has grappled with vampires, mobsters, giant monsters, cults, supervillains, even an earthquake. And yet Gotham remains a cesspool, its streets riddled with crime, drugs, wealth disparities, and a corrupt and broken justice system. So it begs the question, beyond Batman, are there more effective ways to save Gotham City? To answer that, we must first delve into an aspect of Gotham that many fans aren't even aware of. The actual history of the city. We'll include all Batman canons in this video. And of course, spoilers will follow. What are you? I'm Batman. 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 That's Batman. I'm Batman. No, the other line? Oh right. This is... <clears throat> This is The Invisible Lens. The long, sordid history of Gotham is why it feels so natural to accept Batman's desperate efforts as the only option to save his city. According to legend, prior to colonization, an evil warlock, Dr. Gotham, was captured and imprisoned in a tomb under what becomes Gotham City. As time passes, evil emanates from the burial site, corrupting the minds of all who come near. When the warlock finally rises after centuries of imprisonment, he beams with pride at the maniacal city he's created. During the American Revolution, Gotham is the site of a major battle, and it's rebuilt by four families. The Canes, the Crowns, the Cobblepots, and the Waynes. Finally, in the 19th century, Gotham enters modernity, undergoing a period of economic growth during the Industrial Revolution. This is also when Wayne Enterprises is officially founded. What begins as a dozen merchant businesses becomes one of the biggest companies in the world. Then the Great Depression hits. Crime rates and overall suffering surge, and during that time, Batman emerges. But the city never shakes its economic strife, as the depression brings about a permanent rise in violence and crime, as it did in many real American cities. Gotham's infamous alley of crime, the Narrows, calls to mind Skid Row in Los Angeles, in the way the poor and the homeless are funneled there, perpetuating vicious cycles of violence. And Gotham is outfitted in Gothic and Art Deco architecture, much like Chicago. Other aesthetic features, like Chicago's elevated trains, iconic Lower Wacker Drive, where scenes from Batman were actually filmed, and narrow alleyways, give the Gotham we come to know a rhythm and a darkness that heighten the drama that takes place there. But Chicago is more than the inspiration for Gotham's physical layout. It also inspires the political and socio-economic landscape of Gotham City. So if we're trying to save Gotham, and if Gotham is based on Chicago, we must look at what plagues the Windy City. For starters, Chicago is deeply stratified along socioeconomic lines. Chicago's north-south divide is infamous, as are its history of zoning and redlining policies that have resulted in its countless stratified neighborhoods. For example, the development of high-rise apartment buildings was almost entirely brought to a halt by a wave of zoning laws in the 70s and 80s. That led to the modern-day, fantastically wealthy neighborhoods of Old Town, Lakeview, and Lincoln Park. Gotham's upscale neighborhoods include Gotham Heights, Burnside, considered the most stylish neighborhood in Gotham, and Old Gotham, where Solomon Wayne, Batman's great-great-great-grandfather, convinced his fellow businessmen to build their headquarters. Did those neighborhoods enact exclusionary zoning policies to keep out undesirables, just as Chicago neighborhoods did? Well, that's what Solomon Wayne alludes to in a famous speech to the Property Holders Association. What is a city, gentlemen? A sanctuary, a stronghold, a fortress, a bulwark against the godlessness of the wilds wherein we may be protected from the savagery which lurks. Just as many areas in Chicago were disinvested and left to decay, in Gotham, the Bowery, East End, and the Narrows face the same fate. And these areas breed crime, begetting a dangerous and dark cycle of violence. 
The Narrows specifically is the dilapidated neighborhood in which the infamous Arkham Asylum is located, where Reich al Ghul began his assault on Gotham, and where Bruce's parents die, in Christopher Nolan's interpretation. So to save Gotham, the kinds of real-life policies like zoning enacted in Chicago must be eschewed. Developers and property owners must be able to find new areas of opportunity to build there and to attract private investments and funding for things like security, housing, commerce, and infrastructure. This problem does not need a Batman to fix. It's a real-world political one. And in fact, Bruce Wayne could lead the charge to invest in underdeveloped or crime-ridden neighborhoods of Gotham. It would be a start to the revival of the city's downtrodden neighborhoods, and removing zoning power from the hands of Gotham's public officials would cut down on another problem that plagues the city. Corruption. Gotham police obviously cannot be trusted. We see it throughout the canon. In Batman Begins, for example, the mob controls police officers and judges, as well as unions and the mayor, and yet because the police still have a monopoly on the use of force, it takes Commissioner Gordon going rogue to get anything done. In The Dark Knight, we even hear, And as Raishal Ghul says, You are defending a city so corrupt we have infiltrated every level of its infrastructure. This level of corruption is not only rampant in modern-day Gotham, it's supported by a long legacy of corruption there. The Court of the Owls is a secret council composed of the city's wealthiest and most influential citizens and families. The Court of the Owls goes back to Gotham's earliest days, the 1600s, but by the 21st century, the four founding families have waned in influence, the Wayne family being the only one to remain a power player in the city. However, Oswald Cobblepot, the Penguin, has reversed his family's failing fortunes through organized crime. He even says in Batman Returns, You gotta admit, I played this stinking city like a harp from hell! <laughs> this suggests the political process cannot solve our problem, how to save Gotham City. But the conundrum goes deeper. Because in a city so rotten through with corruption, it's natural for Batman to feel the need to intervene more often and at a deeper level than many of his superhero peers. Batman gets involved with street-level crime far more frequently than most of them, often beating up robbers and drug dealers in the middle of the night. But there's an obvious problem with Batman's approach, and in a way it establishes him as tragic hero just as much as it does superhero. Batman's approach to crime only punishes it, rather than meaningfully preventing it. In one critical analysis, Catherine McCullough of Boston College University wrote that Batman's role as a vigilante is mirrored in the ancient Greek tragedy Eumenides, the final play in Aeschylus's Oresteia. There's this nasty catch-22. Batman seeks law, order, and justice for Gotham and its citizens, and yet acts outside the law in order to achieve it. In the most striking example, it's Batman himself who in some ways empowers the Joker. Here, Batman has the Joker suspended upside down, the visual opposite of himself, symbolizing how the two characters are necessarily inseparable. I think you and I are destined to do this forever. Like the natural duality in yin and yang. Heath Ledger's Joker even says to Batman earlier in the film, No, you. which references a similar scene in Tim Burton's Batman from 1989. You idiot! You made me, remember? And so it is that, paradoxically, Batman, Gotham's greatest hope, in many ways is also its greatest danger. So what could he do instead? Batman must continue to fight the supervillains. There's no story without that. However, when it comes to petty crime, Bruce Wayne would be a more effective tool, an agile, versatile scalpel, rather than a sledgehammer. You don't get it, son. This isn't a mud hole. It's an operating table, and I'm the surgeon. Bruce Wayne could, as an influential public figure, build networks and organizations that demonstrate to Gotham citizens how thoroughly corrupt the city's public services are and he could use his financial might to invest in systems of security, health, education, housing, and transportation. 
all of which would be less susceptible to corruption. In the long run, these efforts would reduce the crime that results from, for example, Gotham's dastardly war on drugs. Where were the other drugs going? I don't know. I swear to God. Swear to me! Speaking of grassroots organizations that fight corruption and things like the war on drugs, if you feel inspired by the ideas in this video and want to take action, visit join.studentsforliberty.org. Assassinations, too, have long been part of Gotham's subculture. The Court of the Owls, for instance, employed a breed of highly trained assassins known as Talons to carry out their interests. And it's no surprise that drugs lead directly to an assassination. But what is surprising is that Gotham's approach to drugs directly exacerbates the corruption there. It provides further opportunities for criminals to get their hooks into city officials and police officers, whose power is increased because they're entrusted to enforce the war on drugs. How did Gotham's war on drugs develop? It's crucial to understand because the answer illuminates another piece to our puzzle of solving Gotham. Gotham's drug problem is modeled on alcohol prohibition, which was in effect in the United States from 1920 to 1933, and therefore fresh in the minds of Batman's early writers and artists. During Prohibition, the transport and sale of suddenly illegal alcohol became a prolific criminal enterprise backed by well-armed, violent gangs. The homicide rate in the United States steadily climbed, and the rise of victimless crimes, namely consumption or possession of alcohol, added to the already overburdened judicial system. To top it all, alcohol consumption actually increased nearly 70%. Repealing prohibition destroyed the monopoly on alcohol maintained by organized crime, and with the black market largely incapacitated, homicide rates went down each year for 11 years straight. But fast forward about 90 years and the United States is in the midst of another prohibition, which informs modern iterations of Gotham. This time we call it the War on Drugs, and its impact is even more deadly as estimates of drug-related homicides reach as high as 50% of the total homicides in the U.S. It continues even despite strong evidence from Portugal, where a 2001 decriminalization statute has had no adverse effects on drug usage rates. Deaths by drug overdose are also among the lowest in the EU. At the same time, the number of drug users seeking medical treatment in Portugal voluntarily has increased. Meanwhile, in the U.S. and other European Union countries, all the arrests and incarcerations haven't stopped the use and abuse of drugs, or the drug trade, or the crime associated with black market transactions. Cocaine and heroin supplies are up in the U.S. too, suggesting that, paradoxically, the more customs agents intervene, the more smugglers import, which begets more political intervention and the cycle grows more vicious by the year. Once again, it is Bruce Wayne, the man, who is best equipped to address this problem. By advocating for more sensible drug laws, up to and including full-blown legalization, he can save Gotham City from eating itself alive. The hungriest institution of all, and a massive obstacle to saving Gotham, is Arkham Asylum. It first appeared in Batman number 258, October 1974, to serve as a forensic psychiatric hospital for the area, housing patients who are criminally insane, as well as select prisoners with unusual medical conditions. It is the Ivy League of Insanity, a Harvard for psychopaths, as Jeremiah Arkham, head of the asylum, describes it in the Living Hell comic book. Neither big enough for all of Batman's villains, nor secure enough to contain them, the Elizabeth Arkham Asylum for the Criminally Insane sits on an island separate from Gotham's mainland. Some incarnations of Arkham have been depicted as federal facilities, receiving direct funding and support from the U.S. government. But whether it's technically a federal facility or a private hospital, this much is clear. Arkham is also granted certain legislative privileges by Gotham City. For example, Gotham law empowers it to unilaterally detain anyone under indefinite psychiatric observation. Prisoners can be held for any period at the director's discretion. 
By locking so many criminal and totally insane masterminds in one place, Gotham's criminal justice system practically ensures that breakouts will be common. That, for example, Dr. Jonathan Crane, the Scarecrow, has a total sitting duck, the perfect opportunity to collect and repurpose those masterminds for his evil intentions. Those realities are grounded in the prison paradox, which argues that mass incarceration might actually increase crime. High rates of imprisonment break down the social and family bonds that guide individuals away from crime, remove adults who would otherwise nurture children, deprive communities of income, reduce future income potential, and engender deep resentment toward the legal system. We can find a real-world parallel. The United States has an extensive and recent experience with this tendency to engender resentment. Because, as one writer argued, there are even parallels between the Gotham of the Dark Knight and how Americans felt after 9-11. Facing a threat it did not understand, how did the US government seek to prevent more terrorist attacks? With a prison that operates outside the restraints of the Constitution, Guantanamo Bay, and the Patriot Act, enabling intelligence agencies to spy on American citizens. Facing a threat he can't understand, what does Batman do in the Dark Knight? He connects to every phone in Gotham City and incites a manhunt for the Joker, not caring about the consequences. In the wake of those extra-legal actions, resentment toward the United States and toward Batman deepens. And so the final scene and Commissioner Gordon's final lines in The Dark Knight can be interpreted as Christopher Nolan's commentary on our post-9-11 culture and society. Why is he running, Dad? Because we have to chase him. Because he can take it. He emphasizes the danger of placing too much power in the hands of a single individual, whether that be Batman, Commissioner Gordon, Harvey Dent, or anyone else, because of this tendency for the use of force and power to beget resentment. And yet, that's the version of criminal justice the character of Batman embraces and promotes. He, an individual, wields massive power, and he uses it to punish people, often with excessive violence for breaking the law, while failing to consider or confront the underlying social issues of crime or the likely long-term consequences of his actions. And so, the very vigilantism that makes him a symbol of hope to Gotham citizens sends a deeper and subtler message to Gotham's criminal class that the law is insufficient as highlighted by the Dent Act, a redundant law that merely makes crime illegal. Bruce Wayne reveals an interesting philosophy of justice in Batman Begins. My parents deserve justice. Well, you're not talking about justice, you're talking about revenge. Well, sometimes they're the same. This is the philosophy that pervades not only the rest of the Nolan films, and more recently, the Batman, I'm vengeance, but the entirety of the Batman canon. Criminal justice, after the fact, is exalted as the highest, most noble pursuit. But the focus never shifts away from punishment, and so its main effect is to create distrust and resentment. And this is Batman's blind spot, his tragedy. No amount of justice will bring back Thomas and Martha Wayne. No amount of revenge or punishment or incarceration will actually save Gotham. So we put it to you, and of course it's no easy question with no easy answers. What would fix Gotham's criminal justice system? Because that fix might just save Gotham itself. And we answer that question with a question. What do the possible solutions to zoning, to crime and corruption, to the drug problem have in common? Gotham's problems are cyclical. They continually produce supervillains, which begets ever-increasing force and imprisonment, only serving to entrench the power of a corrupt police force even further, perpetuating the cycle by motivating villains to buy off the cops, and to innovate new ways to stay ahead of the law. So it's the Thomas Wayne of the Nolan movies approach that might actually work. To do things you're passionate about, to do things on your own terms that public policy does inefficiently, to donate money and time to causes you care about. Like his father, Bruce Wayne can do so much more to fight crime 
without a tricked out Batcave or Lucius's never ending cutting edge technology. According to a study done in 2012, Bruce Wayne's net worth is $6.9 billion, by the way. While Batman must continue to jump off tall buildings late at night, respond to the bat signal, and speed through Gotham on the Batmobile in order for the story to work at all, he could focus those efforts exclusively on the supervillains who inhabit Gotham, leaving to Bruce the more effective long-term route of private charitable initiatives, initiatives that might take some of the power out of the hands of Gotham City's corrupt officials. This is the approach mapped out in Three Cups of Tea, in which a man discovers that by helping to educate women in the Middle East, who then teach their sons not to go into terrorism, he can rob terrorists of their farm systems. In the same way, private investments in infrastructure and housing, advocating for the legalization of drugs, and grassroots crime prevention initiatives and community improvements, even things like returning shopping carts, will do more to improve the city and upend the vicious cycle of violence that its criminal justice system perpetuates. While Batman fights the Joker, the Penguin, and the Riddler, Bruce Wayne is the man to lead the charge, perhaps starting with some of Wayne Enterprises' 15,000 employees toward reducing corruption, reducing the government's influence in housing and drug policy and in criminal justice, and ultimately empowering each citizen of Gotham to do the same. In that way, Gotham City might be able to save itself.